too. Well, nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. <laughs> how then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult for his gold. I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Uh, now, this is the point. <laughs> you fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would the madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room... I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So, you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me. For he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened for fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? <laughs> I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. 
Uh, presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh, no, no, no. It was um, the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Uh, many a night, just at midnight, uh, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt. I pitied him, <laughs> although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, that when he had turned in bed... His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causes, but could not. He had been saying to himself, well, it's nothing but the wind and the chimney, it's only a mouse crossing the floor, or it's a, merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I waited a long time very patiently without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single uh, a dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears... A low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I told you that I'm nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not fix me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. 
If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> Uh, but when I'd made an end of these labours, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, <laughs> for what have I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbour during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged to the police office, and they, uh, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. Now, I was singularly at ease, as they sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God! What could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not Almighty God? No, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells. What a merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 bells from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells.
What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. From the molten golden notes, and all in tune, what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that glistens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it swells, how it dwells on the future. How it tells of the rapture that impels To the swinging and the ringing of the bells, bells, bells Of the bells, 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 bells To the rhyming and the chiming of the bells Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells What a tale of terror now their turbulency tells In the startled ear of night How they scream out their affright Too much horrified to speak They can only shriek, shriek Out of tune In a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire In a mad expostulation of the deaf and frantic fire Leaping higher, higher, higher With a desperate desire And a resolute endeavor now, now to sit or never By the side of the pale-faced moon Oh, the bell Bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair, how they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they have poured on the bosom of the palpitating air, yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows, yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, bells. Bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their melody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people... Ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone and who tolling, tolling, tolling in that muffled monotone feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls and their king it is who tolls and he rolls, 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 rolls a paean from the bells and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells and he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of ironic rhyme, to the pean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of ironic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy ironic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. During the whole of a dull, dark and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul. What was it? I paused to think. What was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the House of Usher? It was a mystery all insoluble. Nevertheless, in this mansion of gloom I now propose to myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. 
A letter, however, had lately reached me in a distant part of the country, a letter from him which, in its wildly importunate nature, had admitted of no other than a personal reply. The writer spoke of acute bodily illness, of a mental disorder which oppressed him, and of an earnest desire to see me as his best and indeed his only personal friend, with a view of attempting, by the cheerfulness of my society, some alleviation of his malady. Although as boys we had been even intimate associates, yet I really knew little of my friend. His reserve had been always excessive and habitual. I was aware, however, that his very ancient family had been noted time out of mind for a peculiar sensibility of temperament. I had learned, too, the very remarkable fact that the stem of the Usher race, all time honoured as it was, had put forth at no period any enduring branch. In other words, that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent and had always, with very trifling and very temporary variation, so lain. The House of Usher. I scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal feature seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity, yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the town. A servant in waiting took my horse and I entered the Gothic archway of the hall. A valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of the master. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellised panes and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. Dark draperies hung upon the walls. The general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. An air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Upon my entrance, Nasha arose from a sofa on which she had been lying at full length. Surely a man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the one being before me with the companion of my early boyhood. The now ghastly pallor of the skin and the now miraculous luster of the eye, above all things, startled and even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as, in its wild gossamer texture, it floated rather than fell about the face, I could not even with effort connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. In the manner of my friend, I was at once struck with an incoherence and inconsistency. His action was ultimately vivacious and sullen. It was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit, of his earnest desire to see me, and of the solace he expected me to afford him. He entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy. A mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. Some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of certain texture. The odours of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light and there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments which did not inspire him with horror. To an anomalous species of terror I found him a bounden slave. I shall perish, said he, I must perish in this deplorable folly. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I learned, moreover, at intervals, and through broken and equivocal hints, another singular feature of his mental condition. 
he was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted, and whence for many years he had never ventured forth. He admitted, however, although with hesitation, that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural, a far more palpable origin, to the severe and long-continued illness, indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution of a tenderly beloved sister, his sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. Her decease, he said, uh, with a bitterness which I can never forget, would leave him, him the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the ushers. While he spoke, the Lady Madeline, for so was she called, passed through a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. I regarded her with an utter astonishment, not unmingled with dread, and yet I found it impossible to account for such feelings. When the door at length closed upon her, my glance sought instinctively and eagerly the countenance of the brother, but he had buried his face in his hands, and I could only perceive that a far more than ordinary oneness had overspread the emaciated fingers through which trickled many passionate tears. The disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent, although the transient affections of a partially cataleptical character, were the unusual diagnosis. Hitherto she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady, and had not betaken herself finally to bed, but on the closing in of the evening of my arrival at the house, she did so as her brother told me at night with inexpressible agitation. And I learned that the glimpse I had obtained of her person would thus, probably, be the last I should obtain. For several days ensuing, her name was unmentioned by either Asha or myself, and during this period I was busied in earnest endeavours to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, and I listened, as if in a dream, to the wild improvisations of his speaking guitar, and thus, as a closer and still closer intimacy admitted me more unreservedly into the recesses of his spirit, the more bitterly did I perceive the futility of all attempt at cheering a mind from which darkness, as if an inherent positive quality, poured forth upon all objects of the moral and physical universe in one unceasing radiation of gloom. Uh, one evening, having informed me abruptly that the Lady Madeline was no more, he stated his intention of preserving her corpse for a fortnight uh, previously to its final interment, in one of the numerous vaults within the main walls of the building. Uh, the worldly reason, however, assigned for this singular proceeding was one which I did not feel at liberty to dispute. The brother had been led to his resolution, so he told me, by considerations of the unusual character of the malady of the deceased, now, of certain obtrusive and eager inquiries on the part of her medical men, and of the remote and exposed situation of the burial ground of the family. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. The body having been encoffined, we two alone bore it to its rest. The vault in which we placed it, and which had been so long unopened that our torches, half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, were small and damp, lying at great depth immediately beneath that portion of the building in which was my own sleeping apartment. The door was of massive iron. Its immense weight caused an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon its hinges. Having deposited our mournful burden upon trestles within this region of horror, we partially turned aside the yet unscrewed lid of the coffin and looked upon the face of the tenant. A striking similitude between the brother and sister now first arrested my attention and usher, Divining perhaps my thoughts, murmured out some few words from which I learned that the deceased and himself had been twins, and that sympathies of a scarcely intelligible nature had always existed between them. 
Our glances, however, rested not long upon the dead, for we could not regard her unawed. The disease which had thus entombed the lady in the maturity of youth had left, as usual in all maladies of a strictly cataleptical character, the mockery of a faint blush upon the bosom and the face, and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lip which is so terrible in death. We replaced and screwed down the lid, and having secured the door of iron, made our way with toil into the scarcely less gloomy apartments of the upper portion of the house. And now some days of bitter grief having elapsed, an observable change came over the features of the mental disorder of my friend. He roamed from chamber to chamber with hurried, unequal, and objectless step. The pallor of his countenance had assumed, if possible, a more ghastly hue, but the luminousness of his eye had utterly gone out. A tremulous quaver, as if of extreme terror, habitually characterized his utterance. At times again I beheld him gazing upon vacancy for long hours, in an attitude of the profoundest attention, as if listening to some imaginary sound. It was no wonder that his condition terrified that it infected me. I felt creeping upon me by slow yet certain degrees the wild influences of his own fantastic yet impressive superstitions. It was especially upon retiring to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day after the placing of the Lady Madeline within the dungeon that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep came not near my couch. While the hours waned and waned away, I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavoured to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the bewildering influence of the dark and tattered draperies which, tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest, swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls. But my efforts were fruitless. An irrepressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame. And at length there sat upon my very heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm. I uplifted myself upon the pillows, and peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened, I know not why, except that an instinctive spirit prompted me to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm at long intervals I knew not whence. Overpowered by an intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet unendurable, I threw on my clothes with haste, for I felt that I should sleep no more during the night, and endeavoured to arouse myself from the pitiable condition into which I had fallen by pacing rapidly to and fro through the apartment. I had taken but few turns in this manner when a light step on an adjoining staircase arrested my attention. I presently recognised it as that of Usher. In an instant afterward, he rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered, bearing a lamp. There was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes, and evidently restrained his terrier and his whole demeanour. His air appalled me. But anything was preferable to the solitude which I had so long endured, and I even welcomed his presence as a relief. And you've not seen it? he said abruptly. You have not then seen it? But stay, you shall. Uh, thus speaking, and having carefully shaded his lamp, he hurried to one of the casements and threw it freely open to the storm. The impetuous fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations in the direction of the wind, and the exceeding density of the clouds which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity with which they flew careering from all points against each other without passing away into the distance. The undersurfaces of the huge masses of agitated vapour were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation which hung about and enshrouded the mansion. You must not. You shall not behold this, said I, shuddering to Usher, as I led him with a gentle violence from the window to a seat. These appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena, not uncommon, or it may be that they have their ghastly origin in the rank miasma of the town. Let us close the casement. Here is one of your favourite romances. I, I will read, and you shall listen, and so we will pass away this terrible night together. The antique volume which I had taken up was The Mad Tryst of Sir Lancelot Canning, 
but I had called it a favourite of Usher's more in sad jest than in earnest. It was, however, the only book immediately at hand. I had arrived at that well-known portion of the story where Ethelred, the hero of the tryst, having sought in vain for peaceable admission into the dwelling of the hermit, proceeds to make good an entrance by force. Uplifted his mace outright, and so cracked and ripped and tore all asunder that the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood alarmed and reverberated through the forest. At the termination of this sentence I started, and for a moment paused, for it appeared to me that from some very remote portion of the mansion there came indistinctly to my ears what might have been in its exact similarity of character the echo but a stifled and dull one certainly of the very cracking and ripping sound which sir lancelot had so particularly described it was beyond doubt the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention for amid the rattling of the sashes of the casements and the ordinary commingled noises of the still increasing storm the sound in itself had nothing surely which should have interested or disturbed me i continued the story but the good champion Ethelred, now entering within the door, was so enraged and amazed to perceive no signal of the maliceful hermit. But in the stead thereof, a dragon of a scaly and prodigious demeanour, and of a fiery tongue, and Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him and gave up his pesty breath, with a shriek so hurried and harsh, and withal so piercing that Ethelred had feigned to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like were of... Here again I paused abruptly, and now with a feeling of wild amazement, for there could be no doubt whatever that in this instance... I did actually hear a low and apparently distant but harsh protracted and most unusual screaming or grating sound. I still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting by any observation the sensitive nervousness of my companion. I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question, although assuredly a strange alteration had during the last few minutes taken place in his demeanour. From a position fronting my own... He had gradually brought his chair so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber, and thus I could but partially perceive his features, although I saw that his lips trembled as if he were murmuring inaudibly. His head had dropped upon his breast, yet I knew that he was not asleep. From the wide and rigid opening of the eye, as I caught a glimpse of it in profile, the motion of his body, too, was at variance with this idea, for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform sway. Having rapidly taken notice of all this, I resumed the narrative of Sir Lancelot, which thus proceeded. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, bethought himself of the brazen shield, which in sooth tarried not for his full coming, but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty, great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips than as if a shield of brass had indeed at the moment fallen heavily upon a floor of silver, I became aware of a distinct, hollow, metallic and clangorous yet apparently muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leapt to my feet, but the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat. His eyes were bent fixedly before him, and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But as I placed my hand upon his shoulder, there came a strong shudder over his whole person. A sickly smile quivered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in a low, hurried, and gibbering murmur, as if unconscious of my presence. Bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. Now hear it. Yes, I hear it, and have heard it. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not, oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am, I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute, I now tell you that I, I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago. Yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, the breaking of the hermit's door, and the death cry of the the dragon and the clangor of the shield, say rather the rending of her coffin, and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison, and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footstep on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman! I tell you that she now stands without the door. 
As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance, there had been found the potency of a spell. The huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of a rushing gust. But then... Without those doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. Then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full setting and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which I have spoken before as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound, like the voice of a thousand waters. And the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, a radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch, thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners, yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odour went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where sitting, poor Fierogine, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes, whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now within that valley, through the red litten windows, see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more.